Okay, so Central Asia, Persia and Afghanistan, 1834 to 1922 from Silk Road to Soviet rule. So um, Central Asia, Persia and Afghanistan is the latest addition to our Archives Direct portal. And it digitizes a really diverse range of materials from the National Archives in London, um, from a series of file classes, all of which are from the Foreign Office. It's a really vast range of materials, as you can see, and um, these can be used to examine the history of an equally vast region, stretching from the Black Sea out to the western borders of China, dating from the decline of the Silk Road in the early 19th century to the era of the Great Game, so the diplomatic confrontation between the British and Russian empires for territory, influence, and so on, um, really down to the early years of Soviet influence and rule over parts of the same area um, and also Soviet diplomatic influence in Persia and Afghanistan and the resource contains a real wealth of documents um, not just diplomatic correspondence but also drafts, minutes, maps, intelligence papers and quite often governments shared by or intercepted from other governments in the region. So one of the great things about this collection is that it provides researchers with access to multiple viewpoints, not just those of senior diplomatics and politicians, and not just those on the British side, but also intelligence agents, monarchs, consuls, military officers, and even just individuals seeking support from the Foreign Office, even Chambers of Commerce at one point. Um, it's really quite a huge range of people and documents. Um, and quite often as well, where you have documents written in languages such as Russian or Farsi, these are translated into English. Um, for example, there are translated copies of correspondence between the emirs of Afghanistan and diplomatic agents representing the government of British India. It's a really amazing source of information on the politics and diplomacy of the region and major flashpoints are covered in great detail. These can even be traced day to day, even hour by hour at times, through original correspondence, telegrams, drafts, minutes. So really just working documents, as well as the final correspondence that gets exchanged. There's also a quantity of documents, a huge quantity relating to conflicts, uprisings, military expeditions, and intelligence gathering in the region. So there are military dispatches from the Anglo-Afghan wars. There are documents relating to Russian military operations as the Russian Empire and subsequently Soviet Russia advances southwards. There's often both political and military intelligence, which is used to track these developments. So there are war office summaries of intelligence concerning not only Central Asia, modern day Iran and Western China, but even going a little further afield, you occasionally see summaries about Korea, for example. And there are also letters from political agents. So individuals employed by the Foreign Office in, say, modern day Iran and Uzbekistan, who are corresponding with the British ambassador in Tehran, sharing all this intelligence again from across a really wide region. I think possibly most interestingly of all, though, is the fact that the collection includes accounts of the region's societies, its cultures, agricultural practices, everyday life, religious life, really quite micro level politics as well, all of which are recorded in substantial detail by not just diplomats, but travellers, officers and what I suppose you would call adventurers and explorers, um, as well as the aforementioned agents. Um, you also have a lot of who are reporting events in quite granular detail. There's also a huge amount of detail on border incidents. So the borders of this region were quite unsettled at the time. And so you have documents, for example, on the Panji incident, which is a clash between Russian and Afghan troops, which almost leads to war between Britain and Russia. And again, you can trace this in detail through the original telegrams, through correspondence, um, coming into London from St. Petersburg, from Tehran, from India, even from Afghanistan itself via India. There's also a great deal on the construction of communications and transport infrastructure in the region, of business interests, of 
competition for various concessions to op operate all sorts of services in Persia, and that sometimes between both states and companies, as well as individual um, business people. And so this is very much informal as well as formal imperialism that gets covered in this collection. Um, and finally, then there are later documents which provide insights into the implications of the October Revolution for Russia's neighbours, um, the advance of the Red Army into what are now the Central Asian Republics, and also British policymakers' fears of a Soviet challenge to their position and prestige in Persia, in Afghanistan and in India. So I thought it'd be great to um, just bring up a quick highlight, one of really a great many in the collection. Um, so we've got a sort of patchwork of documents up here. And I thought the one on the top left is one of the most interesting or one page of one of the most interesting or from the entire collection. So this comes from a piece relating to the first Af Anglo-Afghan War of 1839 to 1842. So when forced to present Parliament with printed copies of correspondence concerning the origins of the war, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Palmerston, ordered the suppression of certain incriminating passages from the published version. This is a printed copy of the originals, um, produced for official eyes only, and on it you can see Palmerston's annotations of what should be cut out of the version which was presented to Parliament and thus the public, just highlighting how a really quite clumsy attempt at a cover-up happened, and the lengths to which the British government went to justify a controversial action, simultaneously revealing which details were deemed especially sensitive. And that's one of the fantastic things about this collection. You have these working documents, you have maps, you have all sorts of brilliant things, almost always just there in one folder that you can access online, um, as it is in the archive, and it's all in date order. And yes, it's, it's genuinely a very extraordinary collection, which I think will allow researchers and students to trace the history of a vast and diverse geographical region in really enormous detail. And I think there's nothing more I can really say about about it. That's it in a nutshell, I think. Um, here's a question for Matt um, about um, the phone office files for Central Asia, Persia and Afghanistan. And that is about the maps. Um, um, your slide alludes to over 250 maps. Um, what uh, featured one which has been sketched out in pencil. What other kinds of maps are featured? Okay, so yes, there are a great number of maps in this. Well over well over 250 of them, um, and it's it's really quite a big selection. You've got these sort of sketched rough maps of say where a railway line might be intended to go what somebody can see of a military position that's in front of them. Um, there are also copies of Russian maps, Russian official maps. In fact, there's even one which is um, a map of where Russian surveying operations had been recently, which a Russian official had shown to um, a British diplomat who'd actually taken a photo of it. Um, and it's a reproduced photo. It's quite an amazing thing for 1879. Um, there are maps used by the War Office. There are even printed ones where you get different countries' interpretations of a border drawn on them. You have just these pen and ink ones, um, which shows um, different projected railway lines and the routes of roads. And also the geography of a region, which has actually changed quite a lot. Um, the Aral Sea, for example, is much smaller now than it was at the time. So really, there's just an amazing variety of these maps that really help you, there's no better word for it, map the events onto something that you can used to visualize things. So I hope that's I hope that's a suitably um, fulfilling answer. 